Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our service. I hope you are tuning in to watch and listen to the Word of God. We will be having some beautiful music, and at the same time, we'll go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll see our pastor preach a message from the heart. I have a few announcements. Um, On July 12th, At 7 p.m. at Fairmont Community Park, we're coming together for prayer. Um, They're calling the event, the Calling Fairmont to Unity. And I believe unity is a very important thing in this time, in this day, that our community should never be divided, that we should always come together. And on this flyer that you see, it has this verse. And I just want to read this verse. Because I love reading the word of God. It says, I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. As you can see, that comes out of Psalms 121 verses 1 through 2. And I definitely invite you to this event that will be on Sunday at 7 p.m. at Fairmont Community Park. Um, The... I have one other announcement, or just a reminder, on Wednesday nights, we do have Bible study at 7 p.m. You are more than welcome to come. Um, Just remember, we have face masks um, at the door. Uh, Also, please uh, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, and um, you can sit with your family, um, but stay socially distanced at least six feet. Um, With that being said... I welcome you again to our beautiful service, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you. enjoyed our music. Um, Welcome again to this 
awesome service. Um, I do want to take a moment to go to the Lord in prayer. I also want to remind you, and I know I said it in, um, in the welcoming, the, the call for prayer in Fairmont, at the Fairmont Community Park on the, uh, the 12th of July at 7 p.m. I think it's important that our our community does come together and pray together um, to really put the Lord first. Um, because the only cure for sin that creates division is Jesus. Um, with that being said, I have some prayer requests. Um, let's continue to remember our health care workers and those that are battling the coronavirus, um, as well as those um, families who have succumbed to the virus. Um, I, I know recently that there was even a scare within my family. Um, my brother-in-law was um, working, and uh, someone at work had tested positive. So it, it's real. It's real. Um, it affects us almost every day. So let's go ahead and and keep those families in prayer. Um, remember Mr. Larry Barnes' family as he passed away Saturday morning. Um, their family will need much prayer and comfort. Um, let's remember Wilma Chavis' family um, as her funeral service is also um, this morning. Let's continue to remember Elijah Hunt's family as his funeral was um, this past Tuesday. Um, I want to continue to remember Brother Brantley Oxidine, Miss Carla Jacobs, and her family, Miss Linda Jacobs, as well as Sarah Jacobs, um, Beatrice Sweat, Margaret Aiko, Mr. Donald Clark, and Mr. Wade Clark. Um, we know there are many other prayer requests, so we want to remember each other in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come together to worship. Lord, I just ask you to, to reach out and touch everyone that's watching this message today. Lord, keep unity on our hearts. Um, we know that you are the only cure for division within our nation, Lord, that the more that we turn to you and follow you, the closer we will come together as brothers and sisters. Lord, so many people have suffered, suffered this last week, families losing loved ones. Lord, be there to comfort those families. I know it's a difficult time when those that we love so dearly I'll move on to a better place. Even though they're with you, we still miss them here. Lord, look out for those that are they're on the front lines, testing people or, or providing medical service or, or helping those that are suffering from the coronavirus. Lord, this pandemic has taken a toll on our nation. We have seen some of the most ugliest things in the recent months. And it all started with this virus. Lord, I just ask you to remove this virus from our nation. Also, Lord, remember all those that sent in prayer requests or those that have prayer requests within their hearts. That we continue to live with hope, faith, and love. That we remember those three day, three, three things in every aspect of our lives. That those around us that we love, that we truly love, that we show love, Lord, that we continue to have our faith in you, that someday you will come and join us with you. Keep our faith in our in our salvation, in our walk with Jesus, that we never turn away from you, that we continue to follow you. Lord, that hope, hope is the greatest thing. 
that I could stand here right now and hope for a better tomorrow. I want to end this prayer with verse 1 out of Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Yes, I do. Cause you brought me. Yes, you brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Mighty long way. Oh, I thank you, Jesus. 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 I thank you, Oh, yes, I do. Cause you brought me. Yes, you brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Yes, you have, because you brought me. Yes, you brought me from my head.
so glad that you have decided to join us for our worship service. We pray that you've had a wonderful weekend up to this point, this holiday weekend, as you celebrate, as you've celebrated the freedom of our, of our nation. Uh, we know that there's so much going on around us, but we can't let that stop us because what we do know is that the sun comes up tomorrow. No matter what's going on, the sun is coming up tomorrow. And we, we continue to live our lives and we continue to trust the Lord with everything in our lives. And today, as we uh, turn to the book of Acts, we're going to continue in the direction that we have been going. And as we're looking through the book of Acts at this point, we've been, it's been verse by verse. I'm not so sure it will continue to be verse by verse. I, what I do know is I want us to see how the church is to respond to different things that the church becomes faced with. And as we go through the book of Acts, I hope you begin to really see that. And, and there may be some series in the middle of this series. I, I know I haven't titled the series at this to this point, but... But I just, I just feel we need to, to really understand our role as born-again believers whenever we're faced with things that this world throws at us. I, I do believe God has pressed this upon my heart uh, to go in this direction. And we want to look today at the first persecution of the church. The first persecution of the church. And if we would title anything about today's message, we would, we would want to title it Standing in the Face of Persecution. If you have your Bibles, we want to ask you to turn to chapter 4, the book of Acts. We're going to look in verses 1 through 12. 
verses 1 through 12 in the book of Acts uh, in chapter 4. And as you're turning there, uh, just want to share this information with you as it relates to persecution. Uh, in the summer of 2009, Katrina Sinzon de Carlo, Katrina Sinzon de Carlo, a nurse at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, was told that she would help a doctor perform an, ab an abortion or be fired, even though the hospital knew that it was against her Christian values. In September of 2009, at Pace High School in Florida, Principal Frank Lay and Athletic Director Robert Freeman went on trial in federal district court for saying grace before their meals on, on school property. They were charged criminally for flagrant First Amendment violations. In August of 2009, Rivka Barre fled from her home in New Albany because her father, a Muslim from Sri Lanka, was going to kill her in what is known as Islamic honor killings because she had converted to Christianity. Now, even though, even though she, she was spared death, her two sisters who were living in Dallas, Texas, were not. In 2008, Amina and Sarah Saeed of Dallas were killed by their father, an Egyptian-born Muslim, in an Islamic honor killing because of their faith in Christ. The potential for suffering for Christ is very real. And it's a very present danger and it comes in many forms. But Peter wrote in his first epistle in, in chapter 1 in verse 7 that it, in the midst of persecution, that it's in the midst of persecution that the genuineness of our faith may be found for praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our faith is shown, it's demonstrated in the midst of persecution. Persecution will show where our faith really is. And I'm afraid that the longer we live on this side of life, even in this country, this great country that we live in, the more persecution we're going to find for our Christian faith. Well, let's look in chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, and we begin to see how Peter and John help us to, to really understand the importance of standing in the face of persecution. The Bible says, now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as an Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means has, what, by what means he has been made well? Let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is God's holy word. Pray with us. 
God, we just thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for the freedom that we experience here in this country. And God, we just, we want to thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit who is real in our lives each and every day, each and every moment. For God, we can't go anywhere without you going with us if we know you through your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you for the provisions that you have provided for us. And God, as we come today to open your word, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds. Help us to receive your word. And God, as we receive your word, help us to apply it to our lives so that we can go out and continue to be the people who you've called us to be. And if there's one who, under the sound of our voice, who doesn't know you for the forgiveness of sin through your son, Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would speak to their hearts and that the day they would call upon your name, that they would shout the name of Jesus, for it's at his name that they can be saved. Oh God, we pray that you move and work in the lives of men and women and we'll praise you for all that's done. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Here, as we <laughs> have been through chapter three, and we're looking now at the beginning of chapter four, what we remember that's taken place is that Peter and John, through faith in Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, were used as instruments in the healing of a 40-year-old man who had been crippled from before he was even born. With this miracle, Peter began to preach sharing the explanation of what had taken place in this man's healing. Simply put, faith in Jesus Christ was the catalyst for the healing. It was Jesus who actually healed the man, not Peter and John. Peter acknowledges that neither he or John had the power, nor were they holy enough to accomplish such a feat. But Peter also shares an exhort exhortation he exhorts those who were listening, and by this time, it included the priest. It included the captain of the temple. It, it included the Sadducees, and, and he exhorted them to repent and be converted. And being witness of such a miracle, hearing such a powerful message of truth, we would think that everyone in listening distance would have bowed their head, fell on their face, and, and, and really turned to, to Jesus but again, we are broken people living in a broken world. And as a result of this, for all, this did not happen. Instead, what we find in this text is there's a disturbance during the preaching. <laughs> in verses one through four, we begin to really see here a disturbance in the midst of preaching God's holy word. This disturbance didn't come from a mob of people trying to hijack the moment. The disturbance actually come from the religious leaders who were listening. Those religious leaders were disturbed at Peter preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And as a result of this, Peter and John were arrested as they spoke, according to the text. That is, while they were preaching, they were taken. They were arrested. Now remember that this crippled man had walked through the temple. He was leaping and praising God. And the, the crowd had grown to thousands of people. They were thousands of people looking at the result of, of this man being healed and listening to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the crowd and the noise of it hit God the attention of these temple authorities. And as they came to see what was happening, they became deeply disturbed. Instead of rejoicing that a man who had been broken, a man who had been lame, was now made whole, they were angry and disturbed at what was taking place. You remember something similar happened 
with Jesus in the temple sometime back. In Matthew 21, verses 12 through 15, the Bible says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who brought, bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did the ch and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They were angry. They were disturbed. Something so great had took place and it disturbed the religious leaders. In this passage, we see where Jesus runs out part of the corruption that was taking place in the temple and he restores the truth of the temple to be a house of prayer and not a den of thieves. He also heals the blind and the lame that came to him and, and, and just as well this crippled man that was healed by, as a result of Peter and John's faith and speaking in the name of Jesus, these were not the causes of the disturbance. What actually caused the disturbance? It was that the religious leaders fear of losing support of the people. Losing the support of the people would threaten their position. It would threaten their authority. And in turn, this would affect their standing in society. It would affect their livelihood. And these religious leaders needed the loyalty of the people or they were afraid that they were going to lose everything. We must come to grips with the fact that for some, the word of God will hurt. However, for some, the word of God will bring conviction. And it seems here in the text that conviction did come upon some. And the word of God, hearing the word of God hurt others. For we know that conviction came for the Bible says that 5,000 men, listen, this is not including women and children, but 5,000 men heard the message and they believed. But this won't always happen. There's going to always be those who are threatened by the word of God and they will try to silence us. But Jesus says in Matthew 16 and 18, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I want to remind us that we are going to have to face something. If we stand and we declare the word of God, people will not like it. People will be offended by it. And we must just continue to stand because it is the truth. We must continue declaring the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, even in the midst of persecution. We do this because we know that the persecution will not prevail. Folks, when it comes, when it seems no one is listening, what we can trust is the words of Isaiah Isaiah 55 and 11, God spoke through him saying that so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And we know this to be true because even in a time when we can't come together, even at a time when we can't, as a local body of believers, can't come and sit beside one another, can't come and worship together, we can't come and, and hug and hold one another, we can't come and sing songs of Zion together. But folks, I want to tell you the word of God is still going forth and people are still being saved. Here. There was a disturbance because this disturbance was affecting the livelihood of those who had been considered to be the religious leaders of the day. Now, while there was this disturbance, this disturbance led into a debriefing after the arrest. The religious leaders, including Annas, the high priest, came together on the next morning to put Peter and John on trial. These elders, rulers, and scribes were the governing council and the supreme court of the Jews. The religious leaders wasted no time getting to the point of things. They asked by what power 
or by what name have you done this? Now, the court was doing exactly what God had said do. If we remember in Deuteronomy 13 and 5, 1 through 5, what you'll find is that God instructed Israel to try every man who claimed to be a prophet and work signs and wonders among the people. And if the man was not a true prophet, then he was to be executed. But there was more to their questioning. It wasn't so much that they wanted to find out if they were true prophets because they knew Jesus had risen from the grave. They knew that, that what they thought they had done away with, they hadn't done away with him. <laughs> they knew this. So it wasn't so much about whether or not these men were, were false prophets. But instead, they wanted to stop them preaching the resurrection of the dead through Jesus Christ. In their minds, this just had to stop. They were afraid of losing their position and their livelihood. So they had to take this opportunity to try to put a stop to Peter and John and their preaching. So when these religious leaders, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? These leaders were not sure that the power would not have come from God. Besides, if, if God would, would choose to do something so miraculous in the temple, surely he would work through the spiritual leaders of the temple. And with that being the case, these so-called religious leaders felt that the name and the power that healed this crippled man could have been demonic. Just as they accused Jesus in Luke 11 and 15 of casting out demons in the power of bells above. These men's lives were trenched in sin. Much more than they had ever realized. And, and we have to recognize that being in leadership does not make us immune to sin. I want to make it clear to all of us that we're all in leadership position in one, leadership positions in one way or another. Because lead like Jesus, it defines leadership as any time you seek to influence the thinking, behavior, or development of others, you're taking on the role of a leader. And this is done on our jobs. This is done in our homes as parents. This is done in our communities. And this is done in the church. And while leading in the church, we must guard against the thinking that God can only work through us. God is always bringing in new faces. He's always bringing in new gifts and new talents to do his work. And the purpose of the church and the purpose of this church is too great for a select few to do everything without others joining in. And being a part of it. Here while these leaders. These religious leaders. Were trying to intimidate, intimidate Peter and John. Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit. Stepped up and he answered their question. Before I can say anything else. Let me share this with you. Who have been born again. Jesus promised in Matthew 28 and 20. Lo I am with you always. Even until the end of the world. Amen. When he says amen. That's a period there. He's letting us know that nothing will change this. That this statement isn't changing it. It doesn't matter where we are in life. It doesn't matter who we're confronted with. We can share the gospel. Because we can know that Jesus is there with us. Us. according to Acts 1 and 8 when we received the Holy Spirit we received the power of God to be a witness of Jesus Christ no matter where we are in this world and we should never feel intimidated we should never feel afraid we should never worry about what we're going to say if he's with us he'll lead us and he'll guide us before Peter could speak, God equipped him with the boldness to declare that it was the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that made the man whole. The fact that Peter was willing to speak on Jesus' behalf, God empowered him by filling him with the Holy Spirit. Listen, the reason today so many of us are not empowered is because too often we're not willing to be used by God. 
Peter shares that Jesus here, he didn't just say Jesus, he says Jesus Christ. That is, he's calling Jesus the Christ. And as he's calling Jesus the Christ, he's letting the religious leaders know that this is the Messiah, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Peter is declaring that men must know that Jesus is the true Messiah. He's the true Christ, the anointed one. He's the savior of the world. He's God's only begotten son. And Peter went on to say that he is the one whom you crucified. Remember, Peter was talking to the top leaders of their nation. And he charged them with crucifying not only a man, but the Messiah. This had to cut them to the core. Peter is charging them with crucifying God's very own son. And this same indictment that Peter is charging these religious leaders with is the same indictment we, all men today, are charged with. We all stand guilty of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. Yes, we stand guilty of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. But thanks be to God that he raised him from the dead. And because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our hope lies in him. Peter is declaring that it, it was the power of the resurrected and ascended Messiah who healed the man who was lame from the womb. Peter didn't just share that Jesus was the source of power, but he also shared that he was the source of salvation. Peter quotes Psalm 118 and 22. Here he says the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Peter is saying in this verse that, that, this, ver that this verse in, in Psalms has been fulfilled. God has given us the cornerstone in which we are to build our lives around. But while he was here on earth, he was rejected. Men refused to accept him for who he was, for who he is, and for who he forever will be. But God took this stone despite man's rejection. He still made him the chief cornerstone. And God has exalted Jesus and made him head of all life. In other words, Jesus alone can save. There's no other head, no other exalted Lord. Therefore, no man can be saved under any other name. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. We're living in a time and we're living in a climate when people are so offended by the gospel. For us who have, who have the boldness to declare that there's no salvation apart from Jesus is to offend the majority of the world today. I read an article that said that 30% of the world, 30% of the world Declared to be of a Christian background. And if 30% of the world declares to be of a Christian background, probably 10% of the world are actually Christians. We are the majority. And we're going to offend most of the world. Here... We're living in a place and time where celebrities are pushing their agenda to convince the world that there are many ways to God, but all they're doing is bringing an eternal doom on those who they are influencing, on those who they are leading. And the sad thing is that there are preachers in the land today who are so hung up on popularity, so hung up on prestige, so hung up on money that they're watering down the gospel. And becoming no more than motivational speakers in fear of offending or losing their followers. <laughs> but folks, I wasn't called to gather a following to me. I, I was called to preach and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And like the apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. So let me, let me share this with you. God's church is going to stand. We're going to prevail 
Because the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what gates are, are used for? They're used to keep people in or to keep people out. And the gates of hell is not going to prevent the gospel from prevailing. Listen to me. Before Jesus said that, he declared that they would arrest him and they would crucify him. Jesus declared that he would be taken. And Peter stood up and said, oh, no, they won't. Peter defied the very word of God. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Listen, any time we go against the word of God, we are nothing but a tool of Satan. When Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. He is saying, you cannot speak or live contrary to God's holy word and think you're right with God. And if this causes me persecution. According to the word of God, I must stand in the face of it. Let me ask you, are you ashamed of the gospel? Or are you ready to stand in the face of persecution? Is there anyone here today? Anyone who's listening? Are you ready today? To receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you ready to make him your Lord and your Savior? It's going to cost you. The Bible declares that we must pick up our cross. Take up our cross. And follow him. Oh we, we boast so often about being of the land of the free. Well it cost something. It costs people their lives for this land to be free. And to be free in Jesus is going to cost you too. People may walk away from you. People may come against you. But if you choose Jesus, he'll stand with you while you stand in the face of persecution. Are you ready today? Are you ready today to stand for something that's eternal? That is the word of God. The Bible declares that the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our Lord will stand forever. Are you ready today? Do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Do you believe he left heaven and come to this earth and lived a perfect life? Do you believe that, that they crucified him? That while being suspended between heaven and earth, he said, it is finished. That he had poured out his blood for our forgiveness. And when they laid him in the tomb, that on the third day he arose from the dead. That he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he's ascended. And he's exalted to the right hand of the Father. Do you believe this? If you believe this, that's the hard part. Believing that is the hard part. Receiving Jesus is just taking him by faith. And making him Lord of your life. And letting him. Have rule and dominion over you. And he'll change you. You won't have to change. He'll change you. Will you today? 
Are you prepared today? If you are, pray with me, would you? God, I come before you acknowledging that I am a sinner. And God, I, I repent of my sins. And God, I receive your son as my Lord and Savior. I believe Jesus is your only begotten son. I believe he lived a sinless life. I believe he died for my sins and the sins of this world. I believe he arose on the third day. I believe he's exalted by your right hand. And I believe he's coming back to receive his church. And God, I receive him as my savior. Oh God, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for loving me in spite of who I am. Now I ask that you help me to live each and every day. In a manner that would be pleasing to you. That would magnify your son. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Oh if you prayed this prayer. And you sincerely received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Why won't you tell us. Let us know that. That you have been converted. That you have now trusted Jesus as your, as your Lord and Savior. And we'll celebrate with you. As, this, as the choir comes to sing this song of invitation. We'll celebrate with you. In the comment section of Facebook or on YouTube. Or you can inbox us and let us know. Or you can call us or text us. Let us know that you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And we'll be sure to celebrate with you. But not only that, not only do we want to celebrate with you, we want to invite you as we begin to make preparations to soon, hopefully soon, be back together. We want to invite you to come and be with us. For we know, I believe that this congregation, this body of believers will welcome you and that they will love you and they will pray for you. Reedy Branch, I want to share with you that we miss you. <laughs> we love you. We're praying for you. And we thank you for the prayers that you're offering up for us. We want to thank Brother Marcus and Brother Don and the choir and everyone that takes part in, in putting these services together. Taking time out of their schedules. Even on a holiday weekend. To, to make sure that we're able to present a gospel message to you. So I want to say it once again, I thank you and I love you. And we pray God's blessings upon each one of you.
Adore you. 